So this talk, Update Considered Harmful, it is a clickbait title. Um, it is fairly shameless in that. But I think there's some justification. Normally when people say it's a considered harmful essay, it's something very technical. But actually I think, for me, this is actually sort of more from the perspective of like a, a business owner who you know, wants to make sure that their data in their company you know, is there and, and they can rely on it. Um, I, I think it sort of transcends technical uh, distinctions. So when I was uh, putting to, together this talk, um, I, I thought, well, I could go on a big detour and talk about how great SQL is. And I, I don't want to sort of detract from SQL databases. Um, we're building one. I think the relational algebra that underlies SQL is very powerful, and it's you know, one of the best um, sort of productivity uh, forces over the last how many decades that sort of allowed the industry to grow and allow people to, to reason about their programs and applications. Um, but there is something in, in SQL which is broken, which is this, this update thing. So when I say update, I specifically mean the update statement. So I want to take you through why, why I think it's broken. Uh, just generally look at how people work around this currently, so you maybe identify, oh yeah, I've done that, I've thought that kind of thing before. And then finally, what we're gonna to do to fix it. Can anyone fix it? This is a big open question. So, as ever, it's good to start with a you know, bit, of, bit of history. How much history would you like? Uh, this is the, the sale of a, a, a cottage with a field back in 2600 BC. Uh, but it's representative of the way in which we used to think about communication uh, across time with each other, doing business, accounting, all these sorts of important things. But of course, it's stone we're looking at, right? Um, and when you etch something into stone, it's fairly hard to sort of cross it out. It's, it's an, it, basically, it's an immutable way of storing information. And, uh, and a lot of the world used to work by uh, tallying things and counting, and, and ledgers would be append only. Uh, and this is how everyone was happy thinking for thousands of years, um, until, of course, computers came along and said, hey, we have these things called like, transistors or you know, bits of memory. Um, and they used to be really expensive. They used to be astronomically expensive. So much so that when, when you know, the, the moon landing missions happened in 1969, the price of core memory was $1 million per megabyte, which just, you know, it's, it's huge, right? Uh, and of course, it's tailed off you know, in recent decades. But this graph just summarizes, for me, the, the transformation in this industry that we're in. Um, and really, we're still very much at the cusp of, you know, this, this is the, the exponential scale on the left keeps going down, you know? It, it, it is quite a tremendous thing, obviously ignoring the floods in Thailand that made it go up a bit. But basically, uh, the most interesting part from a database perspective all happened in this yellow region here. So between 1970, which is when Ted Codd released the relational model paper, so working at IBM at the time, and he had this great idea about set theory, and maybe we could integrate all this information using set theory a bit better. Um, so 1970, uh, the next key date would be 1979, when Oracle first released their SQL product. So they, they really created the SQL language as we know it. Um, so within nine years, they'd done that. IBM eventually caught up a few years later and released DB2, their, their first SQL product. Um, and then the database people really care about these days, Postgres, started in 1986. So you can see that the, the context in which these databases were originally conceived was that memory was really expensive. So if you're gonna store stuff in your database, it better be important. Um, and that, that really shapes a lot of things. So when we talk about update, you've gotta think, they, they coined that word in this, in this era, this previous era. But what does update actually mean? <laughs> I, when I was researching this talk, I was really expecting to have like, this really interesting etymology going back hundreds of years. Uh, but actually, it was coined in the, about the 40s. Uh, and it's basically just business jargon. It's, you know, I'm going to bring you up, up to speed with what I know of the world. Um, and uh, of course, there's a noun and a verb version. And I was actually surprised, a bit of a detour, learning that backdate is an older concept, which is interesting, of course, you know, counting contracts, it's quite an important thing to say something's backdated. But update is, is newer, and it doesn't really have an, an interesting etymology other than that it's recent. To be really specific, you know, it, it, it means to bring up to date. And I'll take you through what SQL does and the meaning it has in SQL, which is quite different. So in SQL, you have a, an update statement here. You want to say, I want to take this table at the top, and uh, wherever the customer ID is one, I want to set that first name to Johnny. So in this case, we're setting John and he doesn't like to be called John anymore, so we call Johnny. Fine, we're gonna let him do that. Uh, we've updated the application, um, except where in the second table has the word John gone, right? 
The answer is, it's in the bin, right? We, we, we forget that John was ever a value in the table, um, and the database reclaims the space and allows you to sort of keep a constant size data set, which is you know, maybe important in the 1970s. Now, the, the word John may also go other places. It may go to some kind of point-in-time recovery system, some archives, some bin, long, bin log replicas. But essentially, it's inaccessible from the point of view of the SQL. The SQL no longer has access to that previous value. Um, now, I don't remember the word update in those previous definitions sort of describing that at all. I think it's like a completely different word. And I think the SQL update really is just delete plus insert, which is not at all how we, like in a contemporary sense, use the word update. An update sounds like accretion, right? Um, so I think what might be a better word, if they'd gone back, if we go back in time and get the SQL authors to pick better words, maybe amend would be a good word. Uh, another word that you could use is replace, and I think this is possibly my favorite choice because it has the word place in it. And this ties nicely to ideas that Rich Hickey, the inventor of Clojure and, and the Datomic database, talked about a lot. Place-oriented programming, place-oriented databases, and he essentially says a lot of the, uh, the way we structure our programs, information systems, is based on uh, sort of, yeah, thinking in terms of finite resources, reclaiming space after you don't really need uh, you know, old versions of data. Um, and this sort of legacy of thinking in place orientation is ultimately holding back a lot of the uh, good work that could be done because we're sort of in this tar pit, sort of struggling to, to stay afloat because everything's changing all the time. That's, that's the kind of vibe. Um, and he proposed instead this, uh, what we call the epochal time model, where you very clearly separate the, the, the changes to things over time. And instead of discarding old values, you say, hey, no, that value is immutable. And you can reference that in the future. Anyone can reference that. And so by having this very clear distinction between identity uh, and values, you simplify your model of time. And so this, this is great, right? But he gave this talk in 2012. Sadly, you know, it was too late for, for the SQL authors to do anything about it. Um, but this is quite technical, right? Uh, you know, functional programming, this is quite in the weeds. What is the real problem with update? That's what I want to challenge you or challenge you to think about. And I think it's given this definition of update equals uh, delete plus insert, it's when is, when is delete ever desirable? Uh, and I think to answer this question, really it comes down to a simple formula. It's when is the value of storing that data less than the cost of storing that data? But the question is, who determines the value? And how do you predict what that value will change over time? And, the, and, the, and how do you predict the cost is going to change over time? And how, what, how much energy do you want to put into making that good prediction? And the problem is, as database or application developers are trying to use a database, you're continually confronted with making this decision. Is this thing worth keeping or not? Um, so wouldn't it be much nicer if the default experience was to not delete things? Uh, and I, th I think the, the problem with update is that Delete is, is right there in the definition in, in SQL terms, and that, that is the problem. And as business owners, you, know, you don't want to, to have development teams using technology which is losing your most precious resource. How are you supposed to make forecasts and decisions about things that you don't even know you need to ask about, but in six months' time you want to go back and, and see and build a big analytics report? So with developers, you know, we're, as developers, we're quite happy uh, with this, um, with the status quo to some extent. Obviously, I'm not. but. Uh, but the business people, they're just like, we want more data. You know, data is differentiation. So, so how, do we, how do we cope with update? So this is now sort of moving on to the next bit. We're all agreed update is a, is a problematic thing. So when I want to sort of consult the internet these days, uh, I am guilty of going on chat GPT and typing in a question and saying, you know, hey, what, what's the most popular database? How, how do you do things with it? So the answer, of course, it gives is Postgres. You know, use Postgres. It's like the safe choice. No one's going to get fired for using Postgres. Um, but specifically, I want to ask ChatGPT, how do I cope with updates in Postgres if I don't actually want to delete the data, if I want to maintain a record of data? So I asked this question, how do I maintain records? And it says, hey, use audit tables. Generate a second table, put some triggers in. Hey, presto, now you can like, remember the previous versions of, of values in your tables. Um, and that, that's OK. You know, we can work with that. That's, you know, how many tables are in my application? Okay, maybe I need like 50 triggers per table or something like that. Then you might start thinking, well, how, 
If I change my schema, do I need different versions of audit tables? How do I cope with migrations in audit tables? And again, I asked ChatGPT, and it came back with JSONB, which is probably quite a good answer. Like this is, uh, since JSONB has come on the scene, people are really, really enjoying using it. It's this way to cram denormalized data into Postgres, but there are problems with it. Uh, one, it's completely orthogonal to the relational model. You have to denormalize. Um, the type system is limited, uh, and it's still like a relatively new thing. It's not. It's not like absolutely the de facto choice that everyone should, should go and use. But it is a solution. Um, so then it's like, well, maybe, maybe JSON B plus audit tables is, is, the, is the answer, and that's enough. Uh, but I think the, the sort of the, the gold, gold bar challenge from, from my perspective is can you provide developers with the ability to undo, so, or application users. So someone's you know, typing in a CRM system, they make a typo, they're like, oh, no, the previous name was right, but like, can I just control Z? Can I, is there an undo button? Oh, there's not in this thing. I'm going to go out hassle the developers. Can you, please, can you implement undo so the next time I don't lose you know, the, the, the field value that was just set? And they're like, yeah, that'll be like a three-month project. Because trying to implement undo is actually like a generally hard problem, um, unless you've thought about it ahead of time. And certainly, unless you've thought about it ahead of time, you've probably lost the data, or it's going to be a really expensive surgical operation to, to mine through archives to get it out. So ChatGPT says, if I want to maintain an undoable thing, here's you know, classic, uh, here's a bunch of things we don't really know, um, you know do it yourself. And I, I think this, this is quite uh, telling of the fact that there is no real good answer. Maybe people in the audience here would have, like, yeah, this is my preferred solution. Um, but I think the fact that Postgres doesn't ship with a solution, if it did, ChatGPT would know about it, right? Maybe this is 3.5, maybe, maybe I need four. Uh, Here's another question for it. Um, this is like bonus question. Let's say I'm going to have these audit tables. I'm going to fill it full of JSON B documents. Is that going to fill up my Postgres? Like Postgres is quite premium storage, like these big database clusters. Like uh, it, it, get, it gets expensive, and maybe I want to sort of push the colder storage out to some cheaper thing. Like what's the easy way of doing that? Uh, and it says, yeah, just replicate it out. Use change data capture. So it's like I just I just wanted to not delete things, and here are like five problems, sub problems for that. And uh, the, the ways to solve it, like you have to go and invent a whole bunch of stuff, write a lot of code, write a lot of SQL, certainly, to do it. So that paints a bit of a picture. And just to really reiterate, to illustrate it, and there weren't enough memes in this talk, so I wanted to put one in. We've got place-oriented databases uh, at the top, which application developers love using. But the, the expense of that, the, the price of that, is that we lose consistency. And this isn't like update anomaly consistency or, or concurrent transactions, what I'm talking about is the consistency of uh, someone wanting to run a report in six months' time against data that was in the system but no longer is. It's like enterprise consistency. Uh, but the, the most tragic thing is this idea of provenance and this idea of having that cuneiform tablet with the, with the carved into stone. If, if we lose the ability to say what the origin of the data was, um, you know, that, that's like this really tragic scenario. Uh, now, of course, there is another school of thought here. Um, anyone heard of event sourcing? Uh, they, they put the picture on its head. They say data provenance is, is the golden child. Uh, you know, you're an event sourcing architect. It's your day job. It's all you think about. Uh, but you end up with this massively complex system. You're essentially rewriting a database uh, in, in, on, on a project time. Um, and you're sort of losing a lot of the power and flexibility of the relational algebra that makes the whole point of using databases good and useful. So, Bit of a diversion, and I, I'm not saying there aren't ways to marry these things and sort of live, have them both sort of working in harmony, but uh, certainly it's not a settled debate how to, how to do this, I don't think. So now you're probably wondering, third part of the talk, who can actually fix this? Well, Ted Codd, when he, when he released relational, the relational model in the 70s, he didn't think about time being so important. He was mainly worried about analysis of existing records, and so in the relational model, everything is now, like everything is current time. The, there has been some work done, though. The, the ISO SQL Standards Committee had done some things. I'll tell you about those. And some vent, database vendors have made efforts to, to solve this problem. Um, but basically, they've all tried, and, and we are where we are. Now, the most interesting vein of research was sort of in the late 80s. So Richard Snodgrass, who wrote the book on the right, that, that was like an early draft of the ideas around valid time and transaction time, which then became this sort of de facto bitemporal data model, which is what we think about a lot on the XTDB team. And the, the whole idea of this, this model is that it's, it's a way of fusing 
like a first-class notion of history into the relational model. And just to spell out what those two kinds of time are, on the left you have the history of things as the application cares about. So valid time is this fungible, mutable way of saying this thing happened before this thing, oh wait, no, this thing actually happened, I, I want to correct that, I want to go back in time. It's this, this way of modeling things. And system time is just simply the time the data entered the, the, the database. It's the thing that gives you the consistent basis to say you know, th this, the state of the system at this time yesterday, you can rerun a report and get the exact same answer. And that's quite a valuable property. Um, and certainly as functional programmers, we're used to, to thinking in terms of having uh, stable values. So system time gives you that stability. And there are lots of other um, synonyms for these words. So if, you, if you're thinking about like event, event, like if you use Kafka or something, you might be talking about log time and, and event time. But they're, they're basically the same kinds of time. And you can see these patterns crop up in many systems. But the language of, of valid time and system time are, uh, are quite well established. And to sort of really put this more visually, uh, this is a tool I built. You can Google it and find it quite easily. Um, and the, the idea is that the table on the left actually maps to the table on the right. So one to one correlation. So every row in that table has a corresponding cell, and my mouse is hovering over the cells, that's why it's sort of highlighting the, the, to, to allow you to sort of figure out which ones are which. But the, the key point is, we're just essentially on every single table in our database, we're tracking these four additional columns. And when we want to update, we, we don't delete and then insert, we just insert, we're just appending to the table. Um, there is a small tweak to the, the system time end timestamp, but aside from that, it's pure updates or, or um, appends to the table. Uh, and this model, it, it works, and it's, it's useful. And uh, this is what we are, are really excited about. And in Richard Snodgrass's book from 99, he has these diagrams, and it, they just illustrate that if you have one row in your database, you say, Eva owned this flat at this date. And then later, you want to say, ah, now, now we find out Peter owns it later. Or maybe you know, Peter phones up and says, hey, I bought, just bought it off Eva. Um, what you want to do is to say, update prop owner set where property number equals 7797, seven, and just have a very simple SQL command, right? That's, that's the ideal. But in reality, if you want to do that with, in this example, it's SQL 99, but it's still true of uh, today, you have to write something really long on the, on the left, right? This is a whole bunch of code just to manage how to insert correctly into this two-dimensional space of versions. And it's a lot of code, right? That, that's a lot of room for complexity and for brittleness to, to creep in, and it's, it's arguably something that developers don't need to be doing. Like, the database should be able to take care of this. And there are ways to make that happen. And just to be really clear as well, like, when you, when you insert, you can't just insert one row. You, you have to sort of split these rectangles. So it's like quite a gnarly little problem. Um, and you really don't want to be figuring this out sort of during your project. So if a database can solve this, that's great. Of course, the SQL ISO people, uh, they, they, they're well aware of Richard Snodgrass's work, and the database vendors were being pressured by their customers to say, you know, we really want this temporal functionality in our databases. And so they all got their act together. 2011 uh, released the new standard, and it, it brings these ideas of bitemporality into databases. Uh, here we have uh, an example of what that looks like to query this bitemporal table. We have this additional language to say for system time as of, and you know, where, where this period contains this. And there are, uh, like Alan Interval uh, does this period overlap this other period all these kinds of uh, interesting logical predicates you can, you can write. Um, but that's not the interesting part for this talk. For this part, what we're really interested in is, is what the update statement looks like. And it's very simple. And what the database does is maintains these timestamp columns for us without us having to write any boilerplate code to say, hey, I need to stop this previous version from being valid, and now this new version is valid. It's like it's just built into the semantics of uh, updating tables. So it is very automatic. Uh, it's auditable because it, it will keep that transaction history. That, so that's, that's the truly immutable history. Um, and yeah, this is, this is quite a good building block. If everyone was, was using this, I wouldn't be giving this talk. I wrote a blog post a few years ago which, which surveyed a lot of the databases to see, you know, OK, well, it's been eight years since the standards released. How, how's everyone getting on? And he went through and he said, well, SQL Server, it has uh, transaction time. MariaDB has it now implemented this sort of valid time as well. Oracle's done both. IBM's done both as well. But there's all kinds of quirks and caveats and people not quite following the standard to the letter. But notably absent is Postgres, right? So Postgres hasn't added this. The, the, the most popular, safest choice database has not solved this problem. 
People have been trying to build extensions, but it's, it's a hard thing. And why is it hard? Well, because the amount of re-engineering you have to do for something that was designed 40 years ago uh, is quite phenomenal because it affects almost every layer of the internals of the database. So the way data is laid out in, in, in storage and disk, uh, then you've got in the, uh, like the query planner needs to change the join ordering and push down these predicates, filtering down in the, in the temporal domain. And then you've got, in the schema level, you've got the implications on things like foreign keys, uh, referential integrity. Like all of these are huge problems for like an existing established code base. It's like, oh, sorry, we need, need to like completely radically change the relational model in order to, to, to make this fly. And so, yeah, for vendors, it's, it, it is an unfathomably complex thing to take something as big as Oracle or, or DB2 and actually make this work. And to their credit, they, they have tried, and, and it kind of works. Um, but the issue really is that for users, you have to think in advance, hey, this table, I'm going to need to track all this stuff. And there's going to be some cost. There's, there's a performance cost, for sure. Um, but there's also just a complexity cost, right? Because if you're going to put these extra uh, timestamp columns in your tables, uh, you need to then think about, well, when I migrate the table, do I need to copy the original table? Do I need to turn off these constraints, change the table, and turn back on the constraints? Like, this isn't, this is, the SQL 2011 standard went quite far, but didn't go far enough to make it easy. And that's, that's, the, that's the key thing to making technology successful. So the question then is, can anyone do better? Uh, obviously, that's, that's what we're trying to do in the XDDB team. We're trying to take this idea of bitemporality, the solution to the update, this bad problem, trying to take it mainstream because bitemporality hasn't had its time in the sun. And we're going to do that you know, in, in a few ways. First of all, all, that, all updates are bitemporal updates. Um, you don't have to say, hey, this table is specifically a bitemporal table. This one's not. It's just, it's just there. And you don't even have to think about these timestamp columns. They're just hidden. They're just... But when you need them, when you want to go back in time, you're like, ah, thank God I used XTDB. And crucially, yeah, we're, we're building something which is more future-proof than something like Postgres can be because Postgres is built with these assumptions about yeah, disks and how they looked in the 80s. And, and things have moved on a lot in, in terms of cloud object storage and uh, separation of storage and compute and these really key principles about building a modern database. But yeah, so, so that's kind of the end of the talk. I just want to recap that uh, the problem with update is that you've got to delete things. And that's, that's, that's bad. It's bad for business. And uh, it's bad for developers, I think. So anyway, thank you. Uh, we'll we'll uh, let you know if there's uh, a big uh, release in the near future, but please follow along XTDB uh, V2. Thank you. I believe we have time for some questions, so if anyone wants to ask. Hello. Hello. Is there any chance you can explain how the diagram thing worked? You, you sort of briefly went past it. Yeah. So it was um, cool, and you went up straight on. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll get up on stage. So if I, if I hover my mouse, I could, I could show it live. I, I don't know if we have it open. But um, as, you, as you hover around, it's, it's just highlighting the rectangle that's relevant. So if you like, look at the start, the very first line there, it says sys start, uh, 1st of January, sys end, um, 2nd of Feb. And so that, that one is, is this line, right? If I was to hover over this one, it would highlight the top row. And if I highlight the top row, it's, it, it highlights this one. So it's like a two-way binding between these two visualizations. Um, and uh, I've like hidden it. But you, you can, um, if you have some bitemporal data that's already in like Postgres or whatever, uh, you, you can print it out in your console and copy paste it in here. And it will uh, read it into Eden and then visualize it. And it's, this is all SVG uh, written in Skittle, which is quite fun for uh, doing UI stuff. Hey. Yeah, so the question is, what, is, what are these four timestamps? Sys start, sys end, app start, app end. So, so system time is the immutable timeline. So when, t when data enters the database, you say it, the start time is, is, is the time it entered it. The end time of system time is when the next version replaces the previous version. So, so these values are truly immutable, system time, system end. And you don't control those, right? That, that's like the clock on the server. You don't know. So if you actually look, you see uh, some of those sysends are 999, 1231. 
uh, it's like open, open-ended. Yeah. Um, it, it takes a while to build a really good intuition for this, but oh, yeah. So the only time you ever update this table is, is when you update the system end. That's it. You sort of close the interval, and then the, the next version gets inserted. Chip, when asking about uh, when asking Chat GPT about these problems, has it ever responded that XDDB is the answer? <laughs> I, I'm not sure I've had a useful answer out of Chat GPT. I'm, I'm not going to lie. Um, yeah, no, I, I think I think 3.5 isn't even aware that it's called XDDB. I think it's still stuck in Crux. All right. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure.